Good morning and welcome to the Media General Forum on District Assembly Elections and Women Representation in our Governance System. My name is John Hughes. I'm your host of Community Connect on 3FM 92.7 and co-host of TV3 New Day. This morning, we're here at the Executive Theatre and particularly to talk about the bleak nature of how women have been represented, especially in Parliament and uh, with the District Assembly Elections as well. So we've gathered here NGOs and civil society organizations as well as women who themselves intend to put themselves up for uh, district assembly elections. We have a representation from the Electoral Commission and uh, we will have a fair conversation with you in mind while we make progress uh, on that score. So quickly, would like to invite the Acting General Manager of News, Mr. Abraham Asari, to give us a welcome address. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to you. I do this on behalf of my CEO, Madam Beatrice Ajimayabe, who is unable to be with us this morning. But kindly permit me to also... <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to you. I do this on behalf of my CEO, Madam Beatrice Ajimayabe, who is unable to be with us this morning, but kindly permit me to also introduce our CFO, Mr. Bennett Honuche, who is seated right in front, sir. Thanks for coming. And I'd like to also thank you all for, for, for coming here today. So special guests invite ladies and gentlemen. Good morning again. Well, today marks a very special day for us at Media General because it marks the successful completion of the first year of a two-year project under Star Ghana sponsored program, Mission Ghana. Well, throughout the project here, TV3 journalists have done remarkable stories, cutting across all vital issues relating to the upcoming district assembly elections. On several occasions, they directed conversations along the lines of promoting female con candidates for the elections. This has indeed amplified their voice and elevated their status in a bid to stay more relevant and competitive in national issues. We are aware that although women constitute at least 51% of Ghana's population, they continue to be hamstrung in their quest to participate actively at all levels of governance, notwithstanding efforts aimed at stemming the tide of underrepresentation Women continue to grapple with structural and societal barriers that serve to perpetuate a male-dominated society. These issues clearly reinforce the view that while some modest gains have been achieved, Ghana is yet to take a giant leap to address issues around representation of women at all levels of governance. Consequently, there's been a minimal focus on issues such as funding, access to media spaces, social stigma and stereotypes that operate as barriers to female participation and representation in the electoral process. I will therefore call on local, the local government ministry, the Electoral Commission, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, Parliament and all relevant stakeholders to provide the needed support in the form of legislation or procedures to increase the number of women and persons with disability who are at all levels of governance. Media General shall continue to maintain a stern focus on the vulnerable for Ghana to have an inclusive society. Thank you very much, and please do enjoy your stay here as long as this program lasts and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Abraham Asari, is Acting General Manager of News here at Media General. This program is also live on our platforms on 3FM 92.7 in Accra, Unia 95.1 FM, Connect FM 97.1 in Takradi, and Akuma FM 87.9 in the Ashanti region. Also, we will be on 3news.com, and our Twitter and Facebook handles are very much alive and well. It's also brought to you, Ketsi, with funding from Star Ghana Foundation, supported by the European Union, Danida, and the UK Aid. So you're in very good company. We'll start off from the quarters of the Electoral Commission because 
we all know the managers of election in this country. And we'll invite to speak with us the head of Gender and Disability uh, Unit of the Electoral Commission. She has been in, with the commission for over 15 years, and she's been pursuing inclusive participation in the electoral process for over 10 years. She's been involved in a number of international programs on behalf of the Electoral Commission, particularly with the African Union, with the economic communities of West African state, and she's been to Nigeria, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. Echo us, UNDP as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Abigail Amponsa Nutako, who will speak to us briefly. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, even though we are here to talk about women's participation and representation in governance, I have been asked to also talk about persons with disability as well. So I'm basically going to talk about the participation of persons with disability and women in the upcoming district level elections. And we all know that equal participation of citizens, including women and persons with disability, has become increasingly critical for good governance. And behind this is the idea that every citizen, regardless of class, age, gender, sexual orientation, ability, group, culture, ethnic or religious background should have an equal right and opportunity to participate in decision-making processes that directly affect them. Therefore, women and PWDs' ability to participate in politics is a human right, and it, it is upheld by international frameworks and national laws, and is a measure of democratic integrity. If we go straight to the district-level elections, we all know that district level election is used to refer to the district assembly and unit committee elections, and we usually call it DLE. It is an election to re elect representatives at the local level. And the first one was held in 1988, and the last one was held in 2010. And we are waiting to go for another one in December. But per the creation of new regions and districts. We now have 16 administrative regions, 260 districts, and 6,264 electoral areas and units in the country for the purposes of this election. When we talk about the main features of elections, most of you here are assembly members, and you know what is entailed in the DLE. They include the following. DLEs are conducted every four years to elect people to lower government structures. And DLEs are non-partisan in nature. There is no political party involvement. And the candidate cannot use the name of a party, motto, or symbol of a political party. Otherwise, his or her nomination will be canceled. There is no filing fees or deposits are charged. A political party shall not endorse or sponsor a candidate. And a political party shall not canvass for votes for any candidate. No party shall campaign for or against any candidate. In terms of campaigning, the commission does what is called platform mounting. And it is a forum to introduce candidates to their electorates. And it is organized by the electoral commission where all candidates are present to present their message to the electorate. Here, to no organization is allowed to organize any forum or any campaign for any candidate. If any organization wants to do so, it has to do so under the watch of the Electoral Commission. And you are all aware of that. And a candidate, after going through all the processes, can redraw from the elections, even after we have taken nominations. But what is the situation? The situation is that after printing of the ballot, if you withdraw, you will still be on the ballot paper. However, votes cast in your favor would not count. And the areas where voting will take place include the following. There will be voting in all polling stations in the electoral area, 
where one or the other election is being contested. That is where there will be contest for unit committee and district assembly elections. Where both the unit committee and district assembly elections are contested. That is, there will be two elections in those areas. And where the unit committee has five candidates and the district assembly election has only one candidate, there will be no election, meaning that those people have been elected and opposed. So if you boil down to women's participation in electoral process, especially in the district level election, the issue of women's participation in all spheres of life has become a major developmental concern worldwide. And many debates on the above issue have highlighted women's marginalization in all aspects of social, economic, and political life. In Ghana, we all know the percentage that women constitute more than half of the population. And in spite of this large population, women are not well represented in governance. And if we want to consider some of the barriers, they are numerous and varied. They include lack of finance, lack of education, lack of political will, cultural barriers, social beliefs, norms and practices, fear of insults, religious constraints, ethnicity, lack of information, lack of quotas from political parties, high filing fees, among others. And the main issues to be concerned with is the first of them is about the electoral process and the electoral system. If I talk about the electoral system, it is about the laws that regulate elections in this country for parties and candidates. And in Ghana, for the district assembly elections or district level elections, we use the first past the post. And the first past the post is where the candidate with the majority of votes has won the election. And in this patriarchal system of ours, and coupled with our social norms and religious practices, if it is only one person to pass the post, most of the time it is a man. Therefore, social cultural practices are also part of the problems. Lack of finance means that most of the women in Ghana are not gainfully employed and they only go about petty trading and little, little things to get some money to support the family and themselves. Therefore, they do not have money to go about campaigning. And the first past the post is an election that it needs a lot of money. To even get into the primaries and to campaign, you need a lot of money to entice sometimes your electorate or whoever to print your T-shirts, your banners, and your flyers involves a lot of money. And there is no money for majority of women to do these things, and therefore they are left behind. And the public and civic education, you see that the timing of sensitization or any gender-based civic or voter education program have often been described as not fully contributed to encouraging women to participate in the electoral process. Civic education is not continuous and happens only in an election period which does not encourage women's participation in elections. Sensitization needs to be done even during pre and post election periods. But the main challenge is financing. Civil society is doing their best in this regard, but they are also not doing it all year round because of lack of finance. Low level of education is also an issue. And if we see the trend of the percentage of women's participation in the electoral process and their representation as well, it is not encouraging at all. They are always below 10%, except in 2006 when women were about 10% nationwide, represented in the district level elections. Now, if we talk about persons with disability, like all citizens, persons with disability want the opportunity to shape their communities and in doing so, they can become recognized and valued community members. To achieve this status, PWDs need to participate politically. Elections provide an opportunity for their power and influence to be exercised and strengthened. As with other citizens, elections are a fundamental way for PWDs to express their preference and shape political outcomes. 
It also allows PWDs to develop leadership and organizing skills, build relationships, publicly raise issues important to them, demonstrate their abilities, and set the stage for continual participation and leadership. They also have barriers that impinge on their participation. And the most critical is attitude. If an attitude of polling officials and the general public is very hostile anytime they want to exercise their franchise as citizens of the country. Most of them have dropped out of school because of their disability and therefore they have become functional, functionally illiterate and therefore do not have much knowledge about the laws and regulations of elections and therefore cannot effectively participate in the processes. Accessibility is also an issue. Most of our polling stations or activity centers are inaccessible and with work done in collaboration with the Electoral Commission and the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations, majority of our polling stations are now accessible. And this accessibility boils down to those that are built and natural. For instance, you can enter a polling station, the road leading to the polling station is rough and rugged, and the polling station is set at a place where you need to climb a staircase, maybe one or two, or you need to cross a gutter or something like that. The commission is still working on that. And uh, they also have the problem of financing. Now, what does the electoral commission do to support their participation? It must be made clear that participation in elections does not only mean being a candidate. Usually when we talk about women's participation, people think it is women being a candidate, but they can participate as voters, as election officials, as observers, as candidate agents, or any other, apart from being a candidate. Um, so voter eligibility and inclusive registration, the commission has made it in a way that no eligible person of the country is refused registration, especially persons with disability with amputated arms. You know, we take 10 fingerprints during registration, but there's a process called face only, where they can also register and be identified with only their faces during the elections. And our voter education is also inclusive. When you look around, we use pictorial educational materials, posters, flyers, and others. We know that uh, people from the deaf community do not hear what goes on on TV or on radio. However, they can make meaning out of the posters that we put out to the public, the posters that are posted all over. And we have specific ones targeting women and persons with disability to entice them that they are also part of the program. And we do sensitization workshops, and we hope to do so towards this election. We do so for women faith-based organizations and persons with disability as well. And for the capacity building, I'm sure a lot of candidates here, if only there, there are any candidates, will attest to the fact that the commission has been sensitizing candidates during every election, be it parliamentary or district level. All right. And we hope to do so too. Um, sign language. Per my topic, I was expecting to see a sign language interpreter in this theater, and I'm not seeing one. However, with the Electoral Commission, when we do our usual um, campaigns on TV, there is a sign language um, interpreter present. And even when we have these um, sensitization programs, we employ the services of a sign language interpreter. Education is a problem when it comes to participation of women and persons with disability. And we have factored education into the sensitization programs, into the voter education campaigns, where we use our local languages so that those who do not speak English would also understand what is going on. In the same vein, for the ballot design, we also consider that it is not everybody who can read what is on the ballot paper. So it has been made very simple. The picture of the candidate, the name or symbol, and the place to thumbprint has been designed horizontally. 
So whether you can read or write, or you cannot, you only see it and you can easily vote for your preferred candidate. And we give preferential treatment to all persons with disability and women, especially pregnant and lactating mothers and the vulnerable, whether you are sick, you are old, we all give you that, we give you that preference so that when you get to the polling stations, you will not join any long queue to put you off from taking part in the activity, whether it is registration, exhibition, or election. And we train, we continue to train our polling officials to be very accommodating to persons with disability, especially. We are working on access and accessibility to information has become one of our key areas to consider. 2016 elections, we had braille copies of the election day flyers. And we are also working on the accessibility to polling stations. Also, uh, initially, persons using wheelchairs used to vote on their laps or on the floor, sometimes especially those without wheelchairs, those who are crawling, and it was not the best. So the commission has considered this fact and has reduced the size of the voting screen to accommodate wheelchair users. So from 2016 onwards, persons with um, physical disabilities, wheelchair users, will not have any problem having to vote on their laps because the booth is accommodating to them. Last of these uh, measures is that we also have tactile jackets for blind people. You know, blind people usually vote with assistance from either their relatives or the polling officer. However, they cannot guarantee that they are voting for the people they want to be voted for. A certain man actually told us about how his wife deceived him. He knew his candidate was on top, so he was expecting his, thumb, his hand to go like this. Therefore, the wife was so wise, she turned the paper upside down and then ensured that the man stretched the hand. I'm sure it's one of those intelligent ones. When they got home, they were discussing their father thinking he was sleeping, said, your daddy thinks he's smart. I turned the paper upside down, and he heard it. So he could not guarantee even his wife voting for him. Therefore, with the aid of the tactile jacket, they are able to vote. They say they want to vote independently and by themselves. So with the help of the tactile jacket, persons with visual impairment now vote independently, and the secrecy of their ballot is assured. So the underrepresentation of women and PWD at any level of governance and decision making results in a democratic deficit. It is a proven fact that the diverse groups make better decisions, especially when it comes to tasks as challenging as representing the interests of citizens at all levels. Inclusive participation and representation at all levels of decision making processes is critical for equal and equitable prioritization of the practical needs and issues of all. Now, what is our way forward for all of us and the entire country? We need more education for our children and for ourselves. We can educate ourselves with a non-formal education. And the women, we can also space our children, childbirth, to minimize the domestic chores, and then adequate access to information and we will redefine our roles as women in the society. We need counseling and we need more advocacy to ensure that persons with disability and women are effectively, they effectively participate and are effectively represented in all levels of governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Abigail Nutako is the head of the Gender and Disability Unit of the Electoral Commission. And this is live on TV3, First News, Best in Entertainment. Also on all our four radio platforms, 3FM 92.7, Unia 95.1 FM, Connect FM 97.1, and Akuma FM 87.9. Also on 3news.com. Feel free to share your thoughts and comments along our uh, social platforms as we will uh, engage our panelists on every question that you have regarding this general forum 
on a, the district assembly elections and women representation. So the statistics will point to the fact that even though the Electoral Commission has showed us their plan, what they have done in the past and what they are doing presently, 51% of our population is made up of women. However, they are underrepresented for one reason or the other. And I said yesterday that we are quick to sign on to every protocol and convention that comes up, but how to implement it is a big problem for us. We will speak with a woman who has been empowering other women to achieve more. She is an educational administrator. She's been training uh, women and teachers and NGOs for a very, very long time. And she's presently the uh, women's development coach and administrator at the Central University uh, in Accra. Please put your hands together and welcome our next speaker, Irama Benin. Good morning, everyone. I'll have to make a small correction. I'm an administrator at Central University. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here. I come into this discussion as an ordinary working class woman. I'm not coming in as an expert. I'm just an administrator who has two small children under the age of 10. And I travel over 50 kilometers to work every day. I say this to emphasize that the basic issues of life, such as education, health, and infrastructure come to my attention regularly as I live my everyday life. When a child is sick, I'm concerned about the state of the hospital and not the number of women represented in parliament. When I hit a pothole, I don't ask whether the DC of the area is male or female. When I come back home, to a power cut or water shortage, my first response is to groan and complain about how the ordinary person is suffering while the politicians drive around in V8s. I'm an ordinary person. So I will look at this topic from a practical point of view, linking the discussion to how it should matter to us in our everyday lives. As a dreamer, I began to fantasize what it would be like if there were about 90% of all public office positions held by women. Some of my ideas were, there definitely would be legislation to ensure that every office space had a daycare center close by, so a parent could walk in to see their young child a couple of times during the work day. Soccer and golf would be censored. High heels would be banned. And Mother's Day would be celebrated three times a year. There may be more healthy food alternatives at work, including smoothies. Smoothie combinations such as pineapple and contumbri, beetroot and cassava, cabbage and banana, and perhaps cola nuts and mango will become approved by FDA because women would want to watch their weight and men will be forced to comply. So there will be a world of fewer pot bellies. So, this is just to lighten the mood. But on a more serious note, these ideas are to help us to begin to process some questions that could broaden the discussion a bit more. Two main questions. Does the stereotypical views of men and women really represent us and the issues that are important to us? Do the real issues that are supposedly in favor of women favor them only? Does meeting these needs become a disadvantage to men if we look at the picture holistically? We'll come back to address those questions later. So why are there so few women being elected into public office, especially at the district assembly level? The reasons given by experts and academics such as Janet Sewabwating and Isaac Kosi in a paper they wrote in October 2015 were that there are supply side factors and demand side factors. So the demand side factors, supply side factors have to do with the qualities of the women themselves and the demand side issues focus on the electorate's willingness to elect a woman into a position. Supply side factors could include resources, time, money, things like that. And the demand side factors include traditionally accepted gender roles, traditional beliefs, the setup of our electoral systems, the structure of political parties. On both fronts, women have the short end of the stick. 
On the demand side, women generally lack the resources, need, resources needed, especially in the district assembly level, where there are no parties to assist. And when women are able to overcome the supply side problems, the demand side issues can become quite difficult to surmount. How can you succeed to win the vote when all the gatekeepers in the party are men? How can you change age-old beliefs about the role of women in leadership? These are all challenges that make it difficult for women to succeed. To make this less theoretical, I decided to carry out a survey to ask women whether they would consider going into politics. I surveyed about 400 people. 31% said they would consider going into politics, but 69% said they would not. The most, most of the reasons that were given were they were not interested. That was about 19%. Others felt that politics would damage their reputation. That's about 17%. Others felt Politics would negatively affect their family life. That's about 15%. People said that politics, or these women said that politics was far too violent, and that was about 10%. Over 86% of, of those surveyed were between the ages of 20 and 40. And over 95% had educational qualifications above a first degree. So these are women we would really want to see participating in politics, and yet the majority of them say they are not interested. Though the survey won't meet the rigorous academic standards, perhaps it should reveal some things we should pay attention to. Many women will not be comfortable in our political space if we don't eliminate violence and damage to reputation. That often comes with the political terrain that we find ourselves in. Also. Our political space should be accommodating of regular family life. How can we solve the problem? What can we learn from other nations? The suggested solution by many civil society groups to the problem has been to allow political parties to be overtly involved in district assembly level so that women who contest at that level will have party resources available to them. That's a suggestion. Another suggestion is to make all positions at the district assembly level elected positions so that hopefully more women will be elected into those positions. Another suggestion was that there is a minimum assured quota of seats given to all women. But do quotas really work? Let's look at those who have the top rankings of having female representation in parliament. As of 2018, Rwanda, Bolivia, and Cuba had over 50% representation of women in parliament. Rwanda had 61.3%, Bolivia had 53.2%, and Cuba had 53.1%. Let's look at a few facts about these countries. Firstly, all of them have implemented and legislated a quota system to improve women's representation in politics. Their legislation was far-reaching, going down to the sub-national level. Secondly, their HDI rankings are not exactly impressive. HDI is Human Development Index. That looks at the overall development of a country beyond its economic growth. Out of 189 countries, the best of the three was Cuba, and they were at 73. That's the 73rd position. The next was Bolivia. They were at the 118th position. And finally, Rwanda was in the position of 158. All these countries have major and developmental challenges for various reasons. By the way, Ghana ranks 140 on the Human Development in Index. We are not very far away from Rwanda, so we are not doing too well. The third observation is that all three of these countries still accept violence against women, unfortunately. The percentage of women, we're talking about women, who agree that a husband or partner is justified under certain circumstances to beat his wife 
In Cuba, we're 4%. In Bolivia, 16%. And Rwanda, 41%. And yet, Rwanda has the best of women representation in parliament. So does simply having more women in elected public office really change the narrative for women? There's a difference between representation and participation. Is it possible to represent and not participate because the supply and the demand side issues have not been resolved? Let's look at another scenario. How are the countries with the best human development indices faring in relation to having women being represented in their political space? The three countries with the highest HDI rankings are Norway, Switzerland, and Australia. All three nations are developed nations. My observations are, firstly, female representation in parliament for these nations is below 50% for all three, but at least 30%. So it's 41% for Norway, 33% for Switzerland, and 30% for Australia. Secondly, and more interestingly, none of these countries has any national legislation to ensure female participation in politics. Instead, all three have voluntary quotas, which are quotas that are instituted at the party level so it's not the government that determines the quotas, but the parties. It seems to suggest that political parties and not government, for some reason, have found that it is important that they have enough space for women to vie for political office. My third observation is when it comes to accepting violence against women, it's in these countries too. The percentage of women who agree that being beaten is acceptable under certain circumstances in Australia is 3%, in Norway 10%, and in Switzerland 15%. Violence against women is still significantly present, even though on average these numbers are better than the other three countries we first saw. Addressing issues such as gender violence requires action beyond legislature to change inherent attitudes and beliefs. So we should know that having greater participation and representation will not be the solution to all gender and societal problems, even though it will solve some of them. But could it be that as we work harder towards having a long and healthy life, as we work harder towards having knowledge, and we work harder towards having a decent standard of living, which are actually the three human development index dimensions, we will naturally have more women in significant political positions. Could that be the case? Going back to address the two questions I, I posed to broaden the discussion at the beginning, do stereotypical views of men and women really represent us and the issues that are important to us? And secondly, do the real issues that are supposedly in favor of women favor them only? Does meeting their needs become a disadvantage to men if we were to look at the picture holistically? To answer the first question, I may ask, does looking pretty matter more to a woman than ensuring the economic and financial stability of her family? I don't think so. Are men generally more concerned about golf and soccer than about the health and well-being of their families and children? No. Sometimes allowing our stereotypical views to cloud our judgment of what the concerns of the other gender are trivializes the discussion and we lose sight of what we really stand for. Because we are different, we do emphasize different issues more strongly. But like a kaleidoscope, if we consider the issues of everyone at the table, we may actually order the priority, the priority sorry, in a more intelligent and a more holistic manner, and we'll be able to solve the problems. For example, given that when women become pregnant, and I must add, with the essential input of men, no pun intended, they need antenatal care. Why 
don't we make antenatal care services available to the average working woman between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. at no extra charge? By doing this, we will make it possible for organizations to lose fewer productive hours to antenatal care appointments. We will then make it possible for both parents to be part of the process because men can come along too. And perhaps younger women will be more comfortable in politics because there are systems to support family life while they serve in government. The second question was, do the real issues that are supposedly in favor of women actually, fav actually favor them only? And as we solve their problems, do we do this at the disadvantage of men? Let me ask. If there are fewer infant abuse cases because there are daycare centers close to workplaces, does that favor women only? If there is increased financial provision for families because women are paid fairly, does that favor women only? If six months of exclusive breastfeeding leads to healthier babies who become more intelligent adults regardless of their gender, are women really the only beneficiaries of this? We must be careful that the discussion about the issues that bother us do not revolve around who gets the bigger share of the pie. That brings to mind the story. There were two women quarreling over the last seat in a bus. The mate or the conductor asked the driver for help as to what to do. The driver gave him this advice. Tell the woman the last seat is for the ugliest of them all. Obviously, no one took the seat. <laughs> but the truth is, what happens when we decide to solve our problems by only focusing on giving token spaces to one gender or the other? That is the outcome. The tokens are now unattractive because no one is proud to say, at the end of the day, I got here by dint of favors and good gestures. Everyone wants to believe that they worked hard to get to where they are. I'm not saying that there's no place for affirmative action or for quotas, but we must be sure that what we propose to be affirmative does not look like giving breadcrumbs to a beggar, but rather providing the training, environment, encouragement, and empowerment to assist the disadvantaged one, not just to take care of herself, but to be an asset to the entire ecosystem they find themselves in. I truly think that as we earnestly solve the overall developmental issues, including education, health, abuse, income inequality, etc., we will see more meaningful participation of women in politics and not just token representations. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Rama Benin. Let's hear it one more time for her. Does she break your mind enough? Are you sure? Is she speaking your mind? And you like the part about cabbage and banana? I think it runs with scopa to mana. Yeah. But we've heard from uh, the Electoral Commission. We've heard from a women's advocate and administrator as well. Now I want us to turn our attention and hear from the women in the thick of things. Because we all have been speaking about figures, how... It is not favoring women. If you go to Ghana's seventh parliament, for example, you have just 13% representation for women. That's not even half of the 30% that the Women's Manifesto had spoken about. What exactly is the problem? Is it a societal block? Is it a structural block? Or is it just unwillingness to participate? And if you decide to participate, what challenges do you go through? Are there any success stories to share, especially for those of you who are now hoping to get in there? Remember, we are live on 3FM 92.7, on Onya FM 95.1, Connect FM 97.1, and Akuma FM 87.9. We're also live on TV3, First in News, Best in Entertainment. We'll go to Legon, because Legon is in the news. Victoria Esinam Asa Ofe is an assemblywoman there, and she will speak with us, share her experience with us. Welcome here, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. All protocol observed. 
this morning i am here to usually as an academician i would like to do what my sisters just did by uh, doing a long uh, presentation on issues and empirical issues on the field but today i'm coming to you practically from the field and so i will not be talking about empirical issues, scientific issues, but I'll be talking to you about what is happening on the field and the way forward. Uh, by saying that, in 2003, I was involved in um, academic research that looked into participation or perception of women, of perception of general public on the women in leadership positions, elected positions, what are the, their perceptions and whether they would like to elect them or not. And amazingly, about 60% of the people we interview on the field said no, they will vote for the men. They were blind because it was straightforward questions. They said they will vote for male rather than female into leadership positions. I was amazed. I asked uh, the questions, the questionnaire also made room, room for why they are thinking this way. And some of the things that they said, I could just pick few, that women in leadership position are bossy, that the political terrain is too rough, rugged for women to handle. Women are by nature nurturants taking care of uh, children and everyone, including husbands and fathers. And therefore, they are not able to muzzle out to do certain things. They are, I mean, they are too considerate. And because of the political terrain, especially in Africa and in Ghana, it will not be wise to put them there because they, they, huh, when they get off, they will cry. Somebody just said <laughs> when we were fed up by focus group discussion, they said, oh, if it gets tough, they may be crying. And they may be so considerate as ourselves, so they, they will not put out their results. After all that, I decided to, 2004 general election, I followed closely. And I realized that some of the things, most of the things that they said and the voting pattern represented or was replicated. I said, wow, what is happening in this nation? Upon all the fights globally, West Africa, Africa, Ghana, all the things that we have done, all the things that, that have been done from, um, not political, but um, a leadership that is the, when you when you go to the Ashanti, you go to every country. You you say you talk about people who talk will refer to or all of us will refer to Ashanti with a woman figure. Who is that? Yes, we say it without thinking. She fought, and a number of women. I looked at how Yakubu at that time. Honorable Hawa Ogede Yakubu doing so much. And I looked at number of things that women have done. And I looked at women at various positions at home at doing very, very well. And so women population, for even at that time, it was put at 51% above the population of men. And here we were. And we said it, and we went out there, we voted the same way. So I decided to go to the, to put up myself for election. I was, I think I was part of those who were sitting behind at that time. So I went to contest for the Legon electoral area as an assemblywoman in 2006. That was the next election after that research. And by the grace of God, I, won, I was contested by only male, <laughs> interestingly. So it was only male who contested with me. And I won overwhelmingly. I won about 90%. And I said, no, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I said, no. So this, this research and the, what I saw in the results, uh, it's not empirical enough. 
So I joined Abad so for development. I was part of this on the background, Women's Manifesto. And um, I have been in the assembly since at third time in assembly going forward. If this year happen again, then that will be the fourth time. People have been asking. You have you have surmounted this. What about <laughs> other things? You have been standing here for too long. Ginger up and come along with people. The so the terrain is tough. I want to touch this is just intro on the field. I want to touch on the particip low participation of female in politics, especially elected position, both district assembly and national. The figures are there. It has been read out for us. When we go further, we realize that we are not doing well at all as, as female. At the district assembly, it's always below 10% representation by female. When I was in assembly at AMA, we're now in Ayawa West Municipal. The, when I went, around that time was 10 10% 10, 10 it has never reached that threshold again it has never I'm hoping that we get it and parliamentary has been doodling every time it goes up a little bit and we are still very very low it's not in statistical term you can say it's insignificant what is the issue what are the issues why are women all standing up for election and I, as I said earlier on a lot of work have been done. Women have always shown that they have shown leadership position. Women can put together children, women, men, and, and lead them behind the scene, everywhere, at homes, in the offices, in the villages, internationally, locally. So what is happening that when it comes to political leadership or elected position or a managerial position that we, we impart Others, what is happening? Economic empowerment. I was first before we economic empowerment is very important. Women spend most of their money spending on children and family. When there's no food on the table, the woman is worried. The man will be worried, but she knows that the woman is so uh, dynamic that's whatever happened when he goes and come back he, he may have headache he may have stress he may he may be thinking genuinely the uh, the resources are not there but the woman will turn around and make sure that there's food on the table thank you thank you the woman will make sure that the child goes to school those resources are not counted for when a woman stays, a female stays at home or working and generates income, she may even be generating more than the, what the, the male counterpart is generating. But it's not structured. So I'm here to encourage her, before I move to the next point, let us structure our income and put it to good use. Good use for everyone, but we should also budget for ascending to political or elected position and economic empowerment. But most of the time, we wait and say, let's use this as basis. And when we get there, we'll get the men to support us. Where do they, the men get it for, from? Where do they get it from? They put little together. They believe in themselves. And they are resilient. I want to come to the next point, the resiliency on the part of women. Going on the foot, I have seen people saying, are you going for election? Will you contest? Oh, no. Why? Some of the points that have been enumerated here today. Um, I don't think so, because when they go, they will, they will tag you. They will, tell, they will say you are a prostitute. They will say you are... A man, woman, you say you are tough. They will take all, all, all the words that you can think about, and because of that, we fall back. Resiliency, we put it aside. If women, about fifty-one percent, number of us are there, and number of us are there to support, and I also know males who are ready on the field to support female to go there. But the unwillingness on the part of the female to go 
I said, I will go. I can. That can do attitude. We seem to be lacking when we get to election. I don't know what it is, but I can only go to our socialization. That brings me to another point. We are socialized to, uh, as soon as you are born, the gender roles are assigned to us as female. Oba, oba die, ne, baby kitchen, or no, obi obe ma babe ware no. The woman, the female child will be married and go to a home that will be taken care of. So let's empower the the, the man, the female, the male to be able to bring resources and support to men. Who said women cannot or female cannot do that? When we go to our universities, our educational institutions, I'm, I'm sure you agree with me. I'm at the University of Ghana. Uh, you agree with me that the female are doing very, very well. We will do a lot, but when it comes to election, we stay back. So socialization affects us. And that socialization leads us to our mindset that the woman cannot do certain things. And because of that, we have certain statements to support it. That's a man should be resilient enough that he should not cry. Even when he's crying, you remember the research. They say men don't cry. Women, when they get off, they will cry. So I, I look back and say, yes. When, and, and I heard this statement several, but when I went to the food and I came back, I went for the research and I came back and uh, then I, I started hearing this again. See, then I know, yes, this statement has, uh, it's a validation of our socialization, our mindset. Men who even know that they have to support their sisters, their wife, everybody, they know. They believe in it. They are willing to do it. But our socialization does not give room most of the time for us to do it. Because as you are moving on, you hear statements. A woman, when you give her more power, she becomes caricature. So let's, let's, I mean, restrain them. Keep them. <laughs> it's, it's out there. I, based on this, I had conversation with a male group on the food. I mean, so I asked, we were talking about something, and then I said something. I said, ah, the woman was taken out of my rib, just one. So if she, the, how, how should she lord it over me? A man was saying it. This man is very, a fine gentleman, and I didn't expect that statement from me. But he said it without thinking. Without it, because I realized it wasn't his fault. It's socialization. It's the mindset. He wants to do otherwise, but within him, the foundation, what has been built in him, the mindset has, has limited, restricted him from what he wanted to do. He quickly think that the woman was taken off. And he, he emphasized it, just one rib, not, not just one. So if that's how can she take decisions for me? And you see, some of these things, we say it on, on the impulse. And because it is our mindset based on socialization of how, when we are born, the gender rules that are assigned for us. So we need to rise above that. I know there are men willing to, to, to support female in that direction. Now, there are a number of things that we as women can do to, to ascend that political leadership and other leadership positions in, in this nation for us to make impact and for us to show example leadership for others to also see that, yes, we can do it. Another one I was looking at is women or female who are leaders in positions, can serve as mentors, can, can do mentoring for other young ladies or other women. So we should encourage them. I'll come to the way forward. But that is a thing. Because only few female struggle to get to their point. There's something that is called the glass ceiling effect. When they struggle and they get there, as the research said, 
they get tough in. They feel, even if they don't get tough in, they are weak because you have to. They, 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 I mean, it's, the terrain is tough and you need to struggle to get there. So when you get there, you are, you, after fighting, you know that you can fight anyone. So you, your posturing shows that you may not be fighting, but you fought. And so you build muscles. And your posturing shows that you can always fight. So people look at you who are feminine, who are nurturing, who are they find it difficult to approach. Why so? E, that woman, if you get near her, she will give it to you. The man will give it, but <laughs> this the woman is a, it will single out, it will be singled out as being given. Because why? There are few there, and the glass sleeve effect has had impacts on their personality. And so they are even the, they are November gathering will show that they are not ready to accommodate and nurture others. But maybe that is not the issue. So we will look at the way forward, how they can come out and support others. And but we need to persevere. But by making sure that when you get to the food, because when you, you, you muzzle, uh, you are muzzle out, the likely result is that you fall out and not come because you may be wounded enough and, okay, and wa don't want to come, go forward. But we can do we can do more than that. If we look at personalities like Honorable Freema Osei Opari as Chief of Staff, she came from my constituency as a member of parliament. She went through challenges, but she did not give up. And today, she's holding the highest, one of the highest position of the female, first ever. Thank you. And she is, she, I see as a role model. And if she can do it, a lot more of people can do it. So the way forward quickly, the, we need educational sensitization because it's not everyone that is exposed to the discussion that is on, ongoing. So we need to have more sensitization and electoral commission, I believe that you, you have to increase that and civil society organizations, NGOs here, let's, Abatsu is doing a lot. They need more funding to do much, much more. The mentoring aspects, lead, women leaders should be able to open up. I, I picked some of this thing from the fraud. They should open up and draw people and make, I mean, efforts, extra efforts to bring people to mentor them, female, so that we can have increased leadership in this country with that we are able to we are able to set good examples and the numbers will start rising in female leadership our we also as we are looking to get into leadership position female themselves have to make sure that they add value we add value to ourselves in various aspects because we can it's not just that we need women we need women so so women should go what are we going there to do participating getting involved what are we doing we need to add value so that when we get there because eyes are on female because the numbers are small so eyes are on, are on us to see that is she doing it right so we need to double our efforts by adding value to ourselves in terms of education now educational institutions are opening up you can do no formal formal and get to the university get your degree it's not just I uh, academic thing. let's add value in, in various aspects economic value as said let's let's be resilient in everything that we are doing they are young ladies others are waiting and looking up to us and I believe that from here, we'll, we'll charge ourselves and we'll be able to put up more and impart ideas. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. This is our interactive forum under the banner of Media General. It's supposed to be looking at the prospects of women in the district assembly elections, the problems that they have had in the past, and uh, what's keeping them out instead of getting them in. We're here from a very final speaker, Comfort Dabo. It's all the way from Tepa. She's an assemblywoman as well. She'll share her thoughts with us. Please welcome her as she speaks to us finally. We've heard from Legon, so let's get into the hinterland. Thank you very much for this opportunity. 
and we all look beautiful as women and as usual. Uh, like I was introduced, I am an assembly woman, and it doesn't come easy. One thing is that I personally do is that when there's a problem and you cannot solve it, you forgo them, and you look forward. For from history before independence, women's problem have been outlined. Lack of education, we know that. We know we lack resources, we know that. Time, we know that we lack it because you cannot leave your children and husband at home and go say that you're going to follow politics. You have to first do what's supposed to be done before you enter politics. You know our problems already. Therefore, personally, as the other uh, speakers have already outlined their problems, I will not talk about the problem, but now let us all try to bring out the solutions, how we can increase the numbers, because the problems are already there. And we have outlined, like, like I said, from independence, we have said it over and over again. Some of the solutions have also been mentioned already, but then still, women participation are still decreasing. So what are we supposed to do now? I will not talk so much, because what I will say has already been said. So let me share my personal experience as a young assembly woman. When I computer skew, I realized that, no, I have a passion to serve. Like I already said at every platform, every woman is born a leader. Every woman is born a leader. You can take this scenario when you are in the house and you are living home, and you have a, a girl child at home, or you have a baby girl at home. You have this convention that, oh, for my child is there, or my, the, a girl is there. So you know that by the time you come home, everything is done. So naturally, God gave us that power to control. So what happens when we grow up, even when we have formal education? So there are issues with the society that we have to address. And they, the people in authority must know that every woman has something in us. But then they have to help us to bring those things up. I will not say much. Like I said, time has already been passed. So we can also, also outline them. But now, in conclusive, Let's focus on how this affirmative action can be implemented. And that is the only solution. Last week, I went for a forum when they were discussing about this uh, a a referendum about this uh, electing MMDCs. I personally have a challenge with that. Because when you open a, an open election for men and women, mostly men will win. Because we don't have the resources. But then the only solution that can help us all is not elections but it's an affirmative action, which will give women quotas. Quotas that will address our issues. Quotas that will increase our numbers. Else, we will talk, we will talk, we will organize forums like this, we will listen and listen, and then still, the number of women in politics, number of women in administration, number of women in technocrats, whatever, will still decrease. Because the challenges are still there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of quotas, and the representation, there is also the question of value addition, enlightened perspectives, and all of us would get in there. Let's hear now from Star Ghana, uh, our key partners. If Star Ghana is here quickly, because Star Ghana has been making funding available for us to travel around the country to interact with all of you. Uh, but we quickly want to acknowledge the presence of Abantu for Development. Abantu has been very supportive. Let's put our hands together for Abantu. The Electoral Commission is also here, as well as our friends from Pong Katamanso and Ochre Konfo in Amasaman. They are all here. We have some queen mothers. 69-year-old uh, Auntie Maggie is contesting. Let's put our hands together, Auntie Maggie. She is not giving up. We would like to interact now with you. You have heard from all of her, and there's also Auntie Regina Mankwa is with her. Great. So we should like to hear from you, the women now. You have heard from those who have done it, been there, those who have spoken to others. The Electoral Commission has told you they are part. We want to hear from you. Oh, how saying. What it is, or is it that is preventing you from participating? Is it that your husband stopped you, or that you yourself, you are scared? or you are failing to recognize the fact that you can do it, what is it? I want to hear from you. So we'll start, we'll start, no, I'd like to hear from Auntie Maggie first. Auntie Maggie, at 69, why do you want to, to get in there? I want to hear from you. Let me, let me pass the microphone to you quickly. 
Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to contest. I had wanted to contest for a long time, but due to my work and responsibilities, I couldn't make it. But as at now, I'm a bit free. And I know the problems around my area that are not being fulfilled. So I want to go in, stand on behalf of my people, and see what I can do about it. That is my main vision, why I am going to enter into this election. Thank you. Yeah, one more time, one more time, one more time. Thank you very much. Auntie Reggie, let's hear from you. Okay, Auntie Reggie's uh, behind me, Regina Mankwa. Ah, yes, sure, I got it. Let's hear from you as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Regina de Mankwa from Kinkatamansu, and my electoral area is La Lui Electoral Area. La Lui is very big, from Township to Bombaria. And then since Bo was won, a female has not contested before. Wow. Yes. My husband was past assembly member. And this time around, I wanted to contest. We have a lot of challenges. And then the, man, the men are not helping. So this time around, I want to go as a woman. And I know, by God's grace, I'm going to do more for the women. What, what challenges? What challenges are these? The, man, the one that the men are not helping you to solve? Like I said, from Punto Barria, we have a lot of challenges. One is like street lights, our bridges, our roads, water, and a lot of things. And even when we come to education. So as I stand here, Regina, Obi-Wan, I want to contest them. We bring a lot of development. I see, Obi-Wan. I'm sure we have, yes, no, we're giving our women the chance to speak. No brother, brother things. Yeah. Today is sister, sister day. Yes. But now tell us your name, where you're contesting, uh, and then you share your perspective as well. I am Sewa Jomo Bonsu, contesting for Bachuna Assembly. I am in to contest and win. I'm not in to give up at all. Because women, we can do it. It was a woman that brought salvation to the world. If Mary was not there, the world wouldn't have seen the salvation. Yes. Even Deborah in the Bible was the one who led the war when the men went into hiding. Yes, Yasantua has done it. Why can't we do it? The affirmative action, all the women, those that we even invited, we are taking a lead. But this program has enlightened us so much that we should all encourage ourselves and stand, no matter the challenge. Yes, they will say stories, they will name you, they will fabricate stories. They know it's not true, but it's meant to put you off. But I'm encouraging my women, those here and those at home watching us, that women are able, even the men, when they go to the field, they go to the parliament or whatever, wherever they go, when they get the problems, we, the women, that they come to the closest to seek advice from. And when we are there, we will take care of the men themselves. Sometimes they don't know what we feel. In natural fact, they, when we are planning about women, not that the men don't care, but some of them, they don't understand what it is. When a woman goes into labor, when a woman, a child, a child is sick, a lot of things, women understand it better. And when we are there, it's more or less the men being there. Because we think about them as well. And we will plan for the whole. I'm in to contest and I'm in to win. <laughs> okay. I'm sure we can hear from a few women. Yes, we've not heard from you. Let's hear from you. Tell us your name, where you can test them from. Please, my name is Charlotte Ayram Jiraco. I'm contesting in Comte 2. It's my West, Aku area. Do you have your husband's support? Yes, please. Okay. Thank Fire you very away. much. Because women there, we are so special. Everything we say to our men, the response. And I know that the challenges we have in Comte 2 is the men are saying, I'll do it, I'll do it, but they don't do it. But we take our money from our pocket, we do cleaning. 
Women, we have to clean our house, clean our community. That's what we are ready to do. So I'm ready to contest and win, as my sister said. Thank you very much. Hey. Okay. Let's hear. I mean, I'm let's hear quickly from. Please tell us your name. My name is Charity Siame Kandewu, Ajekojo Electoral Area. Okay. The my West. Okay. Thank you very much, Kandewu. panelists. Yeah. Say Ajekujo. and die. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I will say it and die. Thank you. No, you will not yeah. die. Yeah. You will not die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm contesting this assembly election because the area is being dominated by men for so long. And then I was in a, a taxi one day when I closed from shop, I was going home. There was a discussion on a, a radio that about men and women. So the one of the men said, ah, and then most of the men said, Oba Oba And then there was uh, an elderly man in the taxi. He was so vocal, I was just quiet looking at the man. We, the man spoke, uh, when we got to Underbridge, where the market, the new Mandela market is now. Then he said, Munshe Hanina, Munshe, Munshe. The place was so fat. Anka this year, dear Minyayanka, or Babin, sorry if you are Jekujo, na Ombejina, na Yentanechi. And I said, Thank God, this man has weakened me. So when I got home, I prayed about it. And then I informed my husband. He said, Go, I will support you. So that was how come I'm here now. And then this is my second time of coming to TV3. So thank you, TV3 and Abantu. Ajay Kojo is such that we don't have even gutters okay. or drainage. Okay. No road. We have only one school, government school. No clinic, which is a uh, government. Mm. We have a lot of challenges, sanitation problems, open defecation. We have a lot. But a don't lot. carry all the problems on your shoulder. Thank you very you, much. You may Thank die you. young. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Please let's hear from Auntie. So no. I'm going and okay. I'm winning. You are going and winning. Yes. Okay. Yes, madam. Please. Let's hear from you. Let me finish, please. No, no. Uh, you yeah. see, you can't uh, hold. You can't hold us or to. Support. We will vote. We will vote for you. Thank you very much. Yes, madam. Please tell us your name and where you're, where please, you're contesting uh, from. Please, I'm Rebecca Fusia. Yes, madam. I'm contesting the Sakumono Estate, Regimano Estate, uh, all the Sakumono Estate, yeah. And I'm always, I've been a, a unit committee member for almost eight years now. Yeah. And I've been a lot of work, sanitation, co organizing between the community, doing a, a lot of work. Uh, the combat, even the as assemblyman, always leave them work to me. Right now, I'm doing the work day. And I'm not, I don't want to praise myself because we are here. And I have a passion to do a lot of, I have a lot of, I have passion that I'm bringing on, but whatever is in me to bring it in the community. So that's the reason why I'm coming to, I'm standing for the election. Right. When they vote for me, they will do the better what I, I have within me too. So the men should go and sleep. That's all you're saying. The yes. men are not performing. They are not. They are not performing. I don't want to say anything in, uh, in this place. It's not good. They are not performing. They are not performing. Yes. But so say it. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to yes, say uh, well, I'm told, Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. I'm told the time is up. Yeah. Uh, we will continue the conversation yeah. and record for later. But we will have to cross over and do midday news. But if I give you 30 seconds quickly. It's okay for me. Yes. 30 Did seconds quickly. Menu? Assembly member for Dedema Electoral Area. Okay. Two term assembly member. Where is that? Where is Dedema? Dedema, I'm a Sama Okay, it's Dedema. Yes. Okay. Ochrikonfo. Okay, yes. okay. Um, actually, Ed gave birth to me. They trained us eight years ago, mm -hmm. and ever since I became assembly member. And I'm working, and the people are happy with me. So I'm going for the third time. I see. And I'm winning. Wow. You should because be a mentor to, to some of the new newcomers. Yes, because the work is numerous, if not because of our time. If I want to state them, it's very marvelous. So I thank God, Ashing Aid, Abantu has given me the opportunity. Because I'm a teacher by profession. When I was invited for a program like this, I said, I can't. But with the 
training. I took a decision that day. And ever since, I'm managing my time and I'm working. My husband is very supportive. Thank and you. I'm continuing Thank you. to be as Thank you very much. We'll continue with that and, and record it. But I also want to acknowledge uh, the president of Abdul. is a PRO for the Ghana Federation of Persons with Disability. Abdul, thank you very much for your time. And everybody else who came, we appreciate you so much. Speakers, thank you very much. Thank you. Your, your compositions and your combinations were amazing. And we'll keep that in mind. And uh, for those of you who watched us live on TV3 and uh, listened to us on 3FM, Onya FM, Connect FM, Akuma FM, and 3news.com, we say thank you very much indeed. We'll come your way again with another batch of a public forum that will look at another constructive issue with uh, detailed perspectives that will shape national discourse and bring all of us development. My name is Johnny Hughes. Thank you very much live from the TV3 Executive Theater. Say bye-bye to you. We'll see you later.